And so I went chicken soup for the spirit, uh, chicken soup for the soul. I got goosebumps. Told my wife she got goosebumps. Called Mark, he got goosebumps. Called our agent, he got goosebumps. We went to New York, met with 22 publishers. In three days, nobody got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> this is Entrepreneurs the Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is the playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing with Entrepreneur the Playbook. And I have one of my mentors and, you know, I think spiritual healer uh, that I've been blessed to get to know, Jack Canfield, a name you cannot screw up because I got it right. And I'm going to start off with a story, Jack, because, you know, 10 years ago, my life was completely different. I had uh, earlier in life had everything I thought I ever wanted and I ended up losing it all financially. And my wife, who's extremely spiritual, got me involved uh, with The Secret. And I was friends with Lee Brower only because of the economic side of Empowered Wealth. Right. And he was trying to get me to understand this great movie that he had just done. And you guys had just started something called the Transformational Leadership Council. And Fred Johnson, right, he mm -hmm. was involved. And they all were, all these circles of power were around me saying, you are lost and we have a solution for you. And... Later on in life, here I was invited to be a member of tra the Transformation Leadership Council. I have far surpassed my wife as far as my belief in the universe and how things can happen. And we were sitting on a bus. The first time we really got to know each other and you were right in front of me. And my wife kept kicking me. was like, say something to him. I can't believe how full circle our life has come that I you could have funny. actually manifested because now I call you my friend. True. And uh, it's an honor to be your friend. Well, I want, I want to start off by giving some people some backgrounds. You are one of the best authors, uh, most sold and well-renowned authors in the world. And I am more interested, because those books are terrific, in the branding, because you created an entity that far surpasses the content because it's ubiquitous brand. Uh, it's applicable to so many things, and you've been able to, through the evolution of that brand, create more and more content and help more and more people. When you started, what was your objective of the, the first book that you wrote? Well, I'm going to go back before your question, which the first book I wrote was called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Esteem in the Classroom. It was a book for teachers. Then I wrote a book, 101 Ways to Develop Self-Concept and Personal and Social Responsibility. So I was really focusing on educators. The Chicken Soup for the Soul series started as I was running around doing workshops and I was telling a lot of stories because I learned when I was a high school teacher way back when in 1968. Oh, that's the year I was born. I know. Now I know. that we look the same age, though. And I was teaching now, where, high school. Where were you a high school teacher? Uh, Chicago. Okay. Perfect. Inner city Chicago, a uh, place called Calumet High School. And uh, I realized that when I was telling a story, my students were listening. Even if I was teaching about slavery, if I was doing like the seven causes of the Civil War and no one paid attention, if I was talking about how you know, someone was an escaped slave and how they, 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 would, they would like this, you know. Yeah. So basically, I just started collecting stories. And then whenever I would use them, people would say, that story about the Girl Scout, is that in the book anywhere? My daughter needs to read it. That story about, there was a Girl Scout that sold 3,526 boxes of Girl Scout cookies in oh, one year. I want to find her name. I need yeah. to hire her. Guinness Book of World <laughs> Records, you know. And so basically, I'm, I'm coming back on the plane one night, and this had gone on for about a month. Everyone, every talk I gave, someone said, is that in the book anywhere? Is that in the book anywhere? My sales team needs to read it, whatever. And so I wrote down all my stories. I had 70 stories. And I thought, that's enough for a book. And so I started to write it. And then, as you probably know, Mark Victor Hansen, my co-author for a lot of years, we met at breakfast, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing this book. He said, well, what's it about? And I said, it's all these great stories that keynote speakers tell that make people cry and make them give them goosebumps and stories, you know, like that. And he goes, whoa, I want to do it with you. I said, Mark, why would I do that? That's like telling, you know, someone you want to, like a novelist who's written 80 chapters of a 90-chapter book, you want to finish the book with them and be the co-author. He said, well, number one, half the stories you tell you stole from me, <laughs> which That's was great. not quite true. Sure. <laughs> Maybe five. <laughs> and the other thing he said, I got a lot of stories you never heard. And I said, well, I've got 70. If you can, and he said, you have to have 101. That's a spiritual number. I said, if you can find uh, 31 more stories, we'll do it. 
So that's how that came to be. And the cool thing too, that most people don't know this, that, that brand, Chicken Soup for the Soul, which is now a brand worth at least $100 million. We've sold a billion dollars worth of books. Wow. And uh, I think we're up to 47 languages around the world. I mean, you know, like really like five languages in India. And, uh, you know, Hindi. <laughs> well, if, and, if it's in Chinese, then you probably have sold twice as many books as you know of. <laughs> well, for a while that was true. There's probably books that we never saw royalties for. But then the reason we've sold half a billion books so far is a company called Anhui Publishing in China bought the rights to all the stories. And um, they've, they've sold 300, and, well, they've printed 315 million books. And here's where we got kind of, you know, I don't want to say a bad word on, on the interview here, but we can say screwed. <laughs> yeah, you can um, say whatever you want. Whatever. whatever. Was that, I had Gary Vee on this show. Trust me, yeah, you're, you're baby talking. Yeah, so what happened is that they, in the contract, said, we will pay you 10 cents a book for every book we sell. Now, it turns out in China, Anhui Publishing is half owned by the government and half owned by private equity. So they have printed about half of the ones that they printed are used in the schools, which they didn't sell right because they right. are the government right of course. so but i don't care i mean i'm i'm very wealthy and i'm very happy about it i'm glad that we're in china we're as well known as we are anywhere else in the world but that the, the title for that book came because we didn't have a title we had to go to new york sell the book and with an agent and no title so mark and i said well let's meditate for a week every day for an hour and we'll ask you know a higher power for a title and he never did get one that worked on the you third have a higher day, power than him, man. No, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I'm kidding. I just think I have a better meditation technique. You channel it better. But on the third day, Dave, this chalkboard appeared, like a green chalkboard. A hand comes out and writes chicken soup on it. And I say to the hand, what does chicken soup have to do with this book? And the voice said, when you were a kid, your grandmother gave you chicken soup when you were sick. And I said, but this is not a book about sick people. And the voice said, people's spirits are sick. They're living in resignation, hopelessness, and fear. This was the first Gulf War. There was a big recession, not unlike the one we just came out of around 91, 92. Yeah. And so I went, chicken soup for the spirit, uh, chicken soup for the soul. I got goosebumps. Told my wife, she got goosebumps. Called Mark, he got goosebumps. Called our agent, he got goosebumps. We went to New York, met with 22 publishers. In three days, nobody got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> That's the publishing business. I swear. So we literally had to go to the Book Publisher Expo in Anaheim, California. There were, I don't know, hundreds of publishers there. And we went booth to booth for three days with a little packet of 30 stories. And we said, will you publish a book? Will you publish a book? Will you publish a book? We got no's for three days. Late on the third day, a little publisher in Florida said, we'll We'll look at it. They called us three days later and said, we'll publish it. And there was, you know, as you said, that first book sold 10 million copies. And now the series has sold over a half a billion books. That's amazing. Yeah. I, Dennis Waitley told me a story in China, which I loved. You know, the great sales uh, educator. He said, yeah, I went to China and everybody knew who I was. And then every, you know, they learned in the Barnes and Nobles back when he first got to go. Mm -hmm. And his books were all over the place, but he had no book deal. Right. And he said, but it actually ended up as things opened up and the economy opened up to be a great thing for him because later on in his speaking career, he was so popular yeah. uh, in China because they had copied his book yeah. uh, and done that for so long. Now, it's interesting because one thing that you and I have in common is that, you know, although we live in a business world, in a pragmatic world, we seek a higher source. And then I call it transcoding it so that we can actually effectuate at a lower vibration what, what we channel or see right. via meditation. Sure. Right? I, I use theta meditation as my core mechanism for meditation. How did you, you know, you're a little bit older than me, but how did you get involved with meditation? And you, know, you started truly practicing meditation and using it for these right. dis business decisions. I was not even aware of it until I went to um, graduate school at the University of Massachusetts. So I would have been about 20. Don't tell me you're a sports management major because that's like the best sports school. No, I'm not. No, <laughs> Dr. J fan at least? I, Did he go there? <laughs> I was in a school of education. But no, they, the, UMass is a great school. Yes. And um, anyway, I, I went to a lecture by a guy named Ramdas, who was a, a Harvard professor at one point named Richard Alpert. And he was one of the first people to engage in uh, LSD experiments and um, and then he 
went to India and he met a guru over there who he gave LSD to and the, the guru said, I, I'm waiting for something to happen, nothing happened. And he said, and then Ram Dass realized he was already living at that level just from meditation. So he came back and he said, I'm a pusher, but not a drug pusher. I'm a consciousness pusher. Nice. He gave a lecture at UMass and I went and I heard it and I went, wow, this is cool. I'm going to learn to do this. So I learned to meditate and I can't say I meditated every day of my whole life, but I meditated most days. And then I met a guy named Stephen Josephs, who at that time was a Kundalini yoga teacher. And he was teaching uh, meditation. So I started meditating at his center while I was a graduate student. And that's how I got introduced to it. That's phenomenal. And it changed my life. When people ask you, which I'm sure they do, because they know you meditate, how, how do I meditate? What, what advice do you give them when they say, hey, Jack, I really want to meditate. What do I do? Well, th let me give an overarching answer. Find somebody to teach you or find a guided meditation that you can buy on a CD or download from Amazon or from you know, iTunes or like whatever. Like Headspace is one of the ones. Because, that... because what happens is when you're first starting, it's too easy for your mind to go all over the place. And so if you can learn to let someone guide you through it, uh, that's the best way to do it. There are programs like Transcendental Meditation where you can go and pay someone to teach you. Um, but basically, meditation in general has to do with quieting the mind. Um, there's me I, I, do, I do four different types of meditation. And the weird thing is, Dave, I never know when I sit down which one's going to happen. Because wow. I, I might start one of them and it doesn't feel right and I'll go to another one. So I do somewhere I just follow my breathing and just notice whatever thoughts go through my head and allow them to go. And that's more of a Buddhist type meditation. I do one I learned from a woman... I went to this workshop up in, in, in San Francisco and I walk in and I'm expecting this woman to be this kind of new agey person. She's wearing a polyester pantsuit, smoking a cigarette, drinking a Coca-Cola. <laughs> she's got the weirdest looking hair you've ever seen. And her name was Betty Bethards. And she taught us a four part meditation where you start by imagining white light coming up the left side of your body and down. And then in your hands are like this like this and then you do a mantra and so you can do you know i am love or sat nam or any other kind of you know thing you repeat and then you go into what she calls a, a receptivity where you just have your hands like this and you just allow whatever comes into your consciousness and then you close by closing your hands lightly and imagine yourself surrounded by an eggshell of light the value of that is as you go out of meditation you're in a pretty open vulnerable space you're now protected by this light that you've around you. And what we don't realize is that light is actually, a, a, it, it has, it's a reality. Your whole body is made of light. And so, you know, we talk about light beings, light bearers, and all these things. You see the light and so <laughs> forth. You know, you're out of the darkness into the light. And so you're protected just by imagining that, which is quite, quite phenomenal. So that's one that I do. And then I was studied with a, uh, a Kundalini yoga teacher, a Sikh, who their mantra is Sat Nam, which means Sat, truth, Nam, name. Truth is the name of God. And so sometimes I'm called to do that. And then finally, there's a meditation called the Tree of Life, which comes out of Kabbalah or Kabbalah, uh, mm -hmm. the Jewish mysticism tradition that I was taught by a woman um, who was a Christian growing up. And then all of a sudden she got sick. She fell into a trance for 40 days. She didn't sleep but she was like this, and she slept, and this all got downloaded through her, her named Deirdre Hayden, and she started teaching. She, people said, you need to go see a rabbi. You sound like a rabbi. She was right, teaching right. all this stuff. And, was, <laughs> and so uh, the tree of life, you're just bringing energy through all these, what they call them sephirot, kind of like the chakras, but different. And it, it, they each open up doorways into discipline, compassion, balance, taking a stand, stepping forward, being rooted to the earth, wisdom and, and uh, insight and so forth. And there, it's a powerful, powerful meditation. So I'd probably do that more than anything lately because okay. it has so many, um, so many aspects to it. And when you meditate, how, how often, I mean, every day, but how long do you meditate for? I would say on average 20 minutes. Now, yeah, sometimes when I'm, once I'm in there, I don't want to come out. Um, but I'm a very high productive person. I have a lot of to-do lists, a lot of things I want to get done. Um, I'm a three on the Enneagram, which is this esoteric thing. Yeah. Where they, and that's called high achiever. So for me, <laughs> for me, more than 20 minutes often, it seems like a lot. But sometimes I'm just, I don't want to come out. So it might be 30, 40 minutes, but generally 20 minutes. 
I come from a traditionally Jewish family. My brothers are famous rabbis. So when I studied Kabbalah, they're like, oh, there's the next rabbi for the family. <laughs> then I started studying Course in Miracles. Right. And now my wife's like, oh my God, Joel Osteen's going to move over. Dave's going to go on TV. Uh, I like Joel Osteen. Me, oh my goodness, yeah, I can't believe you said that. I, I think if you want to be a professional speaker, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I'm a student of people. I, I, I study history because human nature never changes. I study people because I want to know how they effectively communicate two ways. One, to other people, to give them the goosebumps. Mm -hmm. But also, I notice how they effectively communicate to that which inspires them. Right. And because if you can maintain your inspiration, your connectedness to that power, you can do extraordinary things. Totally. He is extraordinary. I... He has a gift. He's templated what he's doing. And regardless of the content and what you believe, his message yeah. is on point. His message is universal. Yeah. He's my favorite Christian preacher. Um, yeah, me too. That's yeah. A, My wife now is going to freak out when she watches this because <laughs> I watch him all the time. Um, anyway, let's get a little bit to business. The yeah, world sure. has changed since Chicken Soup for the Soul. And content is distributed in so many different ways. In fact, we were discussing earlier that it's almost like a matter of months that content is distributed in a different way. And, you know, older guys like us, we have to have these young people around us just to help us facilitate how can we connect to more people. And certain ideas resonate in certain mediums. How, you know, someone that is more mature and experienced, how have you been able to stay relevant? And tell me about the programs that you have right now. I know you have a new book and some really interesting programs. I want you to tell me about those, but in the context of how the distribution has changed from you know, going to the bookstore and buying Chicken Soup for the Soul. Well, today, most information for anyone under the age of 30, maybe even 40, is digital. And so people, originally it was in your laptop and on your desktop, and now it's on your cell phone or your smartphone, whatever you want to call it and in your iPad or your tablet, you know, whatever, whatever platform you use. And so we've had to make everything available on all of those platforms and they require different kinds of, you know, technology. But I've surrounded myself with young people as well. <laughs> uh, people that are tech savvy and social media savvy. I mean, I have one person that does nothing but handle my LinkedIn account, my Facebook, my um, Twitter and Instagram. Snapchat and Instagram, <laughs> right. and, you know, on it goes. Um, and they'll, they'll call me and say, what should we be posting? Because I, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I once said, do, do I think Donald Trump goes on Facebook every day? I don't think so. You know, <laughs> he's using his time, I don't know, more productively. Maybe Hopefully. in his new position, not so much. I don't know. We won't go there. But the point being that I realized that the most CEOs have people to do that for them. So I, and I can post something on Facebook and I sometimes mm-hmm. respond to things. But generally, it's... Um, it's, you have to be engaged and engaging in this market because you, there's so many voices out there. If you, if you stop for a while, you just fade into the background. And it's, un, it's unfortunate in one sense, but it is what is. So you have to play the game if you want to be out there. And you have a new book coming out. How do you plan on marketing, distributing, and branding? Well, you know, we used to do book signings. Yep. And now there's something called a virtual book signing, which where you can literally have someone interview you or you can just go online like a Facebook live and talk about your book and then send everyone to amazon.com barnesandnoble.com borders doctor you know whatever and so the the idea is now that we don't have to travel as much saves the publishers a lot of money saves me a lot of time I get to be home with my wife more but you have to be there you have to have a really good they call it Amazon campaign yep. where you are doing interviews and you post things on Amazon where you can do a video about your book. You want to make sure you get 20 or 30 people to post positive reviews. Um, not bogus, but you know, if, if I go somewhere and there's no reviews, I'm suspect. But if I go somewhere and there's like, you know, 99% positive reviews, I look at them, make sure they're not just all fluff. But that, that, determines for me whether I'll buy a book or not, quite frankly. Sure. You know, I'll look inside it and so forth. Um, and and then podcasts. You know, we're doing a lot of podcasting and we're doing a lot of video blogs. One of my students, a guy named Mikola Latansky, who's the number one Ukrainian speaker and also Russian speaker that's motivational, um, he does a video blog of three minutes, seven days a week. He's been doing it for the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years. He came to my house once for a seminar I was doing in my living room. I walk into my office about 20 minutes before to get something, and he's in there with his little camera. His wife's got a camera, and 
uh, Tatiana, and they're going like this, and he's going, I'm in Jack Kempfield's office. Notice all the books. Leaders are readers. You know, Jack's <laughs> read 3,000 books. Let's pull one off his bookshelf now. I'm just watching this. He doesn't even know I'm in the room because right. I kind of snuck up on him, uh, not on purpose. Right. And then finally he sees me and says, oh, my God, here's Jack now. Jack, come here. Tell people why you read so many books. But if he's at a conference, he'll be saying, you know, I was just in a session. I just learned this. Or I'm at the Eiffel Tower, and you'll see the Eiffel Tower behind him. And do you know the story about the Eiffel Tower? Let me tell you how it was built. You know, it was one of the greatest That's things great. ever happened. And then he always says at the end, and by the way, I'll be in Kiev on this date, and I'll be doing a seminar. When he started doing that, he was getting 30 people in his seminar. Now he gets 600 to 1,000. And he's doing that all over the Russian-speaking wow. you know, world, like in Canada, the Russian speakers and so forth. So that's, I think, critical if you want to be relevant in today's world. And someone like you, since you've started, you always really, I think, have looked to empower other people, whether yes. it's through your job, your books, your speeches, your workshops. You have a program now, I believe, right? The Train the Trainer. Yeah. And yeah. that's specifically, yeah. tell me a little bit about that concept. Well, after Chicken Soup for the Soul, and I, I sold the company for many, many tens of millions, which I can't disclose because I signed a It's fine. I've seen your house. Trust yeah. me. It must have been a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hoping the mudslide doesn't come. We'll be safe. No, we'll be good. <laughs> um, we, we avoided the mudslide, yeah. unfortunately, on the right side of town. But what happened was I said, I'm going to take a year to figure out what I want to do next. And as I had the money to do that, I realized I wanted to share the principles that had le led me to my success. And then so I sat in bed one morning and I typed everything I knew. It was about 114 principles. And I said, that's too many for a book. <laughs> <laughs> so I narrowed it down, combined some, we got it down to about 64. And that was the success principles, yes. book, how to get from where you are to where favorite. you want to be. And then it was like, okay, now that we've got the book, how do I develop seminars? Breakthrough to success, one day to greatness, all these things that are like different things. And, and we're going around the world teaching these. And when I was in Oman and, and Bahrain and Kuwait and, and Iran and all these Middle Eastern places, um, what's the one I want to think of? Dubai. Dubai. <laughs> what happens is people would come up and say, we need this here. We need people teaching this. We need this in, 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 in our world. And I'd always say, well, come to take my seminar and I'd say, we, we can't get visas. We can't afford right. to come, you know, three, because I was doing three weeks so spread out over a year. So we developed the online train the trainer program, which we've now got 25, about 2,500 graduates in 107 countries around the world. Like even after the big earthquake in, um, where was it, in Tibet, and uh, what happens is we were able to have a trainer who lived there go around the villages and teach the success principles so people would feel empowered and inspired to rebuild their village and get out of the the fear. Wow. We're teaching in Pakistan, we're teaching in Nigeria, we're teaching in Yemen and so forth. So that to me is the thing I'm most excited about. And we have a goal, it's, it's, it's ambitious, but so was a billion books by the year <laughs> 2020, which I think we'll achieve because we're already about 600 million now, is to have a million people teaching the success principles by the year 2030. And um, so we're right now at the place where we're going to scale it. So we've got trainers. Now we're going to train trainers of trainers. And then we'll have regional coordinators, country coordinators, Europe coordinators, that kind of thing. So we'll build a structure to support all that. So that's my goal. And I, if you're watching and you want to empower people in your company, in your downline, in your sports team, you know, you helped me get tickets to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really fun. <laughs> Good. Um, and I met some kids there, I call them kids, they were probably in their young 30s, uh, who are working with athletes coming out of sports, in professional in college, who want to motivate and do things for others and don't have a lot of other career opportunities. And we're working with them to teach those people our success principles, like we teach in our training training program, to allow them to have the skills to go for it. So you've opened up a whole new market of people that I didn't even know existed. Oh, I have more coming for you when they yeah. find out. And I'm so excited because I know Cynthia Kersey uh, and you have a limited edition that you honored me to write the forward in called Unstoppable. And we have a charitable endeavor together That's with right. that as well. And I'm hoping in the future I have an idea for a junior achievement, uh, maybe to get Warren Buffett to write the forward for you and I and do a, a small little book for junior achievement oh, as fun. well. I'd that'd be fun. I'm actually involved it. now with something called JA University. Yeah, we both are, right, yeah, Chancellor's yeah, exactly. of JA. So yeah, so I, yes, okay, that's I talked to, to them this morning, and, and they said, oh, okay. this is a great okay. idea. Why don't you do one? So we thought, you know, well, as, as chancellors, we could fun. do that. Okay, good. Um, why don't we just quickly, 
you know, where can people reach you for these great programs? The website? The well, the website's simple, just jackcanfield.com. If you want to go to any of our one-day trainings that are coming up, uh, Jack Canfield Live um, and Jack Canfield Trainings, another one. Um, but basically, everything's on the jackcanfield.com. There's audio programs, video programs, online training programs, our live programs, um, all of our books, everything that we do, yeah. coaching, all of that's there. A little different than DaveMeltzer.com. I got years to go, but I'm I'm inspired by you. You have a great website. <laughs> I, I've been on your website. It's very good. You did a good job. Ah, the boys, of course. Anyway, last question and my favorite yeah. question. You've done so much for others. You've done so much for your, you know, your own brand. But what legacy would you like to leave when it's all over? Well, my life purpose statement is to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in the context of love and joy in harmony with the highest good of all concerned. So we're not doing it at the detriment of others. And I do that through the books I write, the, the audio, video programs, the online training programs, and now training trainers. So the legacy is all of that. You know, I, I hope that 100 years from now, people are still reading Chicken Soup with a Soul books. I'm sure. I hope that my Success Principles book is a classic like Think and Grow Rich. I hope and intend that my trainers will continue to be there and train others ad infinitum. You know, so that this gets out because, unfortunately, we're not teaching this stuff in schools, as you know. Right. And, you know, nobody gets divorced because they didn't memorize the five exports of Argentina. They get divorced because <laughs> they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to be grateful. All the things that you Forgive. teach in your books. Right. right? Yeah. And um, so I think we're all part of this transformation to bring more consciousness to more people. You're doing it. I'm doing it. John Gray's doing it. Tony Robbins is doing it. Yeah. And it's all part of a movement. And I want to leave that part of my work behind and um, hopefully it'll evolve and, and, and get even better. Well, I, I, I really intend to try to follow you in your footsteps and live that legacy and be one of those people that empower others with what I've learned from you and read from your books for years. And uh, I know your reputation precedes me and it was so n nice to get to know you better and I'm just enthused that we'll be able to do so much more for other people and empower them to empower other people and you are an icon for that and I'm just grateful to have you on the playbook as one of my mentors um, and just wanted to thank you in front of all those great people that watch so thank you great can I say one more thing please anything if you're watching this if you go to my website jackcampbell.com you can sign up for a free 10-day transformation which will be downloaded to your either your phone or your computer and it's a three minute video along with a day's exercise that you do as a homework for the day. And those 10 days can literally change your life. I had a guy who is a multimillionaire um, who is extremely good at what he does. And he just wrote a story that I'm gonna put in a book um, called How a Free Program Changed My Life and Made Me Millions. And he talked about how three, three or seven times, I forget what it was, he started this 10 days, never got around to it. Then he got injured and he's lying in bed for a month or two. And he said, well, I may as well just do those 10 days. And by the time he got through, his total life was transformed. And that's for free. So basically, if you do that and you want more, then take some of our deeper seminars. But um, I thank you for this opportunity. Of course, to share that. and I'll encourage people to do that. In fact, if you reach out to me at, at David Meltzer, let and share the experience of if you're able to accomplish that, what effect it have. And I will pick one person that we will send to one of Jack's workshops oh. if they do that. And so I encourage you to download that and, and we'll send you to that. Uh, but like I said, just a joy and a pleasure. I'm with Jack Canfield, my mentor. Uh, this is David Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing with Entrepreneur, The Playbook.